Peace and wellness, everyone. My name is Asharia Ikundayo, and this is Blatant. Well, welcome everyone. I'm your host, Asharia Ikundayo, and I'm really excited to launch our second season of Blatant here on the Museum of the African Diaspora's platform in partnership with Artists as First Responder. We open today's episode or today's show with a short clip uh, from the film Beloved, 1998 feature film based on the 1987 Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Toni Morrison. It depicts character Baby Suggs in the clearing, uh, in the clearing in the woods after there has been uh, an uprising, there has been an insurrection and the loss of many lives. And she goes on to preach to a small congregation of newly freed people. And I'm gonna read just a little bit uh, of the monologue from the novel, where she says, here in this place, we flesh. Flesh that weeps and laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass and love it, love it hard. She says, yonder, they do not love your flesh. She says, they do not love your eyes, no more do they love the skin on your back. And oh, my people love the skin on your back they do not love your hands. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them, pat them together. Stroke them on your face because they do not love that either. You got to love it, she says. Even more, she says, out yonder. Hear me, they do not love your neck, unnoosed and straight. So love your neck and put your hand on it. Grace it, stroke it, and hold it up. She closes the sermon by instructing us to love your heart, for this is the prize. And I chose this passage and this clip today as representative of this monthly forum, this blatant forum, which I consider a place of clearing. It's a place where Black women in films of all genders offer us words of boundless love and resistance through their imaginations and art practices, and they create across geography and across discipline. And so thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm honored and excited to be joined by two black women artists 
who both work in photography, uh, the use and creation of the archive and the environmental and political landscape. Adrienne Wahid and Zoe Charlton. Welcome to Blatant, dear ones. How are you today? Hello. Really good. Hello. Good. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this is um, a really beautiful way, I think, to begin our 2021 season. Um, with these conversations around uh, the utility of the creation of the archive and both of you utilizing and going back and fetching it, not only um, older techniques of capturing images, but like the, the, the usefulness of time and identity and how you place your practices on the timeline uh, of, our, of our struggle. I think, and that struggle is also uh, an exaltation of our joy. So before we, we dig into the show today, I wanna do a land acknowledgement and in my invitation <clears throat> and introductions of both of you, uh, invite you to also give a land acknowledgement on the place of where you are. So I'm at home today and uh, hosting this conversation from the home of uh, the Ohlone Nation, the unceded land of the Ohlone people in a place called Oakland, California. It's a, a place that I chose to come and live upon. And I stand in solidarity and humility uh, on this stolen land and in solidarity with the First Nations people and all oppressed people, including uh, those who have come before us, those of us who are here and those of us who are coming. I also wanna honor my African ancestors as well and giving thanks and gratitude for their guidance and their lessons. Uh, and I wanna take a breath and acknowledgement of the many, many people, I think more than 2.5 million people who have died in the last 12 months uh, because of contracting COVID-19. So I want to send them uh, ease on their journey. Um, let me introduce just, I mean, I have like, the one line introduction, because I'm, I'm hoping that people like chose to read about uh, your work, both of your work, but Zoe, Zoe Charlton, who uh, I met online at a <laughs> party, <laughs> you know, at a party and uh, your work in the archive, your, um, your beautiful work in the archive. I want to say just a little bit about that you, create drawings and collages and installations and animations uh, using the nude body. Um, in particular, the work that I've come to know you is uh, the use of black women's bodies. And you depict your subject and relationship in their world by combining images of culturally loaded objects and landscapes with undressed bodies. So welcome. Thank you. Um, tell me about where you are today and uh, any opening yeah. thoughts or reflections you might even have from Beloved. Yeah, um, I haven't seen Beloved in a while and I'm really happy to see that clip. Um, but before I get started, I just wanted to, I'll read my land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge the lives and experiences um, and, on, and I want to honor the native communities and nations on whose ancestral lands I live and work on in Baltimore and in DC. I recognize the Nakashtank, the Anacostan and the Piscataway nations. I offer my respect to the elders, the past, present and the future members. Now decolonization is the work to repatriate land to members of First Nations and decentering white settler perspectives and ideologies does not lead to repatriation of indigenous life. That is the, where some of the work begins. I also, like you, want to acknowledge the lives and experiences and the contributions of African-American and African communities whose forced displacement enabled the building of this country, its history, its cultural and academic, academic institutions, and its culture. And through my work in a variety of communities, um, I continue to pledge the work of abolitionism, of equity work and sovereignty. And I work towards joy and safety and collective freedom, um, especially for those 
those who experience the most intersections of oppressive and systemic and discriminatory policies. Ashay, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank Shay. you. My sibling, Adrian Wahid, how you doing? I'm great. I'm yeah. so happy to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, just a little bit of introduction of you. I'm, I'm really excited about your creation of an archive. You created the Wahi Photo Archive, a collection of found photographs of African-Americans from Civil War to the present. And that that archive was collected by the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture in 2015. Um, I came to know you, I think in the last few years here in the Bay Area, yeah. back and forth as a photographer and uh, had the, the pleasure of acquiring your self-published book called Black Joy and Resistance. So yes, thank yes. you, welcome to Blatant. Thank you We're so much. Today. Thank you, Shar, for having me. So um, is it on me now? It's, it's on you. My <laughs> so I'd like to, to start with my land acknowledgement. Um, this is my first one, so please uh, bear with me. Um, I'm here in Brooklyn right now, uh, where I do live and work um, sometimes, half the year. So I'd like to acknowledge the Native communities and nations whose land I live and work on here in Brooklyn. This Native land is the Lenape Hoking land, which is homeland to the Lenape and the Canarsie people. The Lenape identify as a diaspora with federal sovereign nations in Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada, where they migrated after being systematically driven off of this land. So today I offer my respect to the elders, past, current, and future members. And I offer respect to all of those who have lost their lives in the struggle. Ashe. Ashe. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that's really beautiful um, over the, the first season, and what I know will continue to be part of this conversation this year, uh, are are the opportunities for us to teach each other and for us to be in, you know, just kind of this tender, authentic learning space with each other. And I remember um, the first episode uh, last June, I believe, uh, I was with Nona Faustin and uh, Shaniqua Gay, and they uh, were also, you know, kind of like grappling with this idea of a land acknowledgement not both of them, but this idea of how to introduce each other, how to talk about uh, themselves and their siblings and what that means in terms of uh, how they feel about each other's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had this conversation over the episodes around land and what it means to like create on land that is continuously fueled and stewarded by people who um, often we don't acknowledge are even there you know, and how that shows up uh, in, our, in our ancestor reverence in our work, how it shows up in our spiritual practice and how that impacts our work. Um, and those who are literally like our comrades and our creative uh, partners who are doing, you know, this work inside of the, this container that is uh, anti-Black and white supremacists inside this canon that is the so-called high art world. Mm -hmm. So before, mm -hmm. before the both of you um, give us a, a short presentation, let, let me just, let me ask you um, about your artwork in the sense of when we are talking about um, being creative entrepreneurs, when we're talking about being uh, artists and Black women in particular, we're also talking about anti-Blackness mm -hmm. and the political underpinnings that fuel and one parallel with the blatant truths of beauty and rage in our work. Um, talk a little bit, Zoya, about your practice right now around what's being reflected in these times and where your current, what current manifestations are making their way into, into your work. Yeah, yeah, wow, yeah. So I always, I have to answer that by saying, um, I spent about, you know, like several 
people that I know spent a few months actually not making um, because I was making, and I still do, I'm making these large scale collages and drawings um, primarily of women and women with certain kinds of bodies. And um, actually they're bodies that remind me of my grandmother's bodies, the women in my family's bodies. They're larger women. And, um, but in February of last year, um, in March and April, you know, all the way up until about September, I had to stop thinking that the, the health pandemic, the rampant anti-Blackness that was in the news and, you know, in the spaces, I see it in different places that I occupy, um, just made me pause. I, I could not actually make work. I could not talk about making work or even think about it. Um, and even though I think what I do, my contributions are important, but it seemed that I needed to put my energy towards other endeavors and, and actually towards collaborative work. Um, and so I spent my, um, after you know I finished teaching, I spent my entire summer and parts of my fall just really engaged in uh, lots of conversations about what it means to not make work, but just to be like a part of the, like the world and the community and to build with people. So um, when I started making work again, though, um, I felt very refreshed and I felt uh, an urgency to continue to put the kinds of images that I'm making out in the world. And so lately I've been making, or not lately, but for a few years I've been making work that um, was about my grandmother and, um, and her attachment or her property, the property that she owned. Okay. Yeah, so that's where I am right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been, I've been in this conversation with several artists, you know, brothers and siblings and whatnot, yeah. talking about, you know, what, uh, what kind of like through line uh, has happened over the last 12 months in their work and in society and how that's entered into the space. And I wonder, um, Adrian, if you can talk a little bit about the idea of us needing to be sheltered in place and protecting ourselves, but also being drawn out into community. And I know that, you know, there's Absolutely. been, we had some conversation, uh, you know, during the, the tech run around how uh, the uprisings, you know, the need to be out in the street pulled me out of quarantine. Like there was no way that I could not be in that street. Can you, can you speak right. a bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, we, 2020 was just like a year from hell, right? And so we are all hunkered down, um, experiencing this lockdown and this, this real sense of uncertainty and and then, you know, in trying to protect our, ourselves, our family hunkered down, but then the murder of George Floyd happened and, you know, you, you, you have this, this civil unrest. Obviously, we, we've seen it time and time and again, but, but now you have, it seems like America, because of the pandemic, because everyone's home, because people are sitting still uh, long enough to pay more attention to it. Everyone's enraged and, and, and drunk, pushing out into the streets. And so that, that rage actually drew me out into the streets. You know, I was, I was in lockdown and quarantine like most of us. And I was, I was just so angry, um, mm -hmm. I couldn't sit still. I, I had to, my people were out in mass and I had to be out there with them. And mm -hmm. so uh, that once I, once I got out into the streets to, all, to not only just raise my voice, but also as a photojournalist to document what was going on, it was like being out there was soul soothing for me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was, I was drawn out to 
a community of like-minded folks that were 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 raising our voices, um, you know, yet again to to protest, uh, you know, it, for 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 Black lives, and so. Um, the this this body of work, this archive that I've I've sort of um, built now, uh, this past year in 2020 is sort of like now an extension to the work that I was already doing uh, with my book Black Joy and Resistance. And um, when I shot that and self published it in 2018, I had no idea that that it would be so relevant to what we're dealing with and going through now from 2020 and, and now as well. Indeed, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's all kind of like fodder for the fire, but you know, information and data on the timeline and you know how timelines, you know, move in both directions, right? And mm. yeah, you know, we think about, oh, we're gonna keep going forward, but you know, there has to be uh, this conversation that is also about going backward. But this creation of these timelines, and in particular for both of you, um, one of the reasons I was interested in having both of you you share uh, your work is the centering of uh, the Black body, but the particular conversation that you have around Black women and mm -hmm. our bodies, you know, yeah. and Black gaze upon Black women's bodies, you know, not the white gaze, but our Black gaze and our admiration. And, you know, one of the, the pieces that, as, as I read, you know, from Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, is around love your skin. You know, out there, they don't love your skin, but we do love our skin. We do love our blackness. We do stroke upon it, and we do, you know, light it well, adorn it, and, um, and dote upon each other. Can you, can you speak a little bit about uh, this loving of black women and our black skin? Well, loving of black skin and black folks is why I is why I shoot. It's it's what motivates me and what inspires me to shoot. Black skin, black beauty, um, mm -hmm. black brilliance and resilience. That's that's what motivates me um, to pick up my camera and inspires me to to be creative. So I think that for me, it, it begins and ends with the black woman and black folks for sure yeah. for me yeah yeah so my family is i have a matriarchal family and um and you know black women are what i know all i know you know i i i i'm thinking like everybody in my family is like my complexion and um and you know i love my skin i love it um i want to see myself reflected and the spaces that I go into, and I don't often see me, you know, and um, um, you know, in all, like my job life or parts of my art life, and so I make work about me, about me and the women that I know primarily, just so that I can see me. And what I'm also interested in when I do that is the kind of stories that our bodies tell and the stories that we end up telling. Um, whether they're kind of in truth or they're fictions, because my family likes a good story, right? And um, and uh, you know, I, I like seeing I like seeing the way that I we populate those stories and um, those myths and those archetypes and all of those uh, all of those ways. So yeah, I want to see my body. I was just thinking about something, Ashara, if I can just then jump this in. Um, I had one exhibit and I remember um, someone reviewed it and had the nerve to say, oh yeah, she was making all those drawings with, of these women with junk in their trunk. And I was so like offended. I was like junk in the trunk. That's what we look like. That's what I look like. So why is that, why is that the way to describe the women that I'm drawing? And I um, remember thinking then I need to draw more women like this and, and specifically more women that have weight on them, right? Um, because I was really tired of comments like that coming from folks that don't look like me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of um, feelings around being able to see uh, representations and 
photos and drawings and collages of women whose bodies look like my body. Mm -hmm. You know, bodies that have rolls and that have mm -hmm. stretch marks. And, you know, we don't, we don't live in a culture that, you know, appreciates and celebrates stretch marks when they come from bearing babies or they come from not, you know, being size two. Um, and <laughs> you know what I mean? We, yeah. we, we might be okay with stretch marks if you're, you know, someone who's a bodybuilder and, you know, your body is becoming, you know, stronger and more muscular, you know, but I, I really have um, a lot of fond memories of being able to like fold into the softness of my grandmother, you know, mm -hmm. onto my chest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? There, there is nothing like lying upon a black woman's chest. Yeah. There's nothing no no one will deny that that is the most beautiful feeling like yeah. no one <laughs> you know it was like exactly. there, is no lie. there is no lie there so um you know exactly. with, with that let, let's um adrian let's let's jump into your your sharing your presentation and you yes. yes for us and um thanks yes. so much to elizabeth for running tech uh Thank you, for us elizabeth. Today. So, uh, yes, I want to start here because, like I said, it, it starts with the Black woman, you know, uh, it, everything begins and ends with the Black woman. We, we just put Biden in the White House, um, you know, we, we deserve our props, it, you know, it's not going to be a magic fix, but, you know, without us, where would we be? So I wanted to start with this image and um, this image was taken in New York on June 13th, 2020. Um, this was the Black Excellence March. And this was when we had just marched over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan, marching towards uh, City Hall. And I, what I, I just love this image because you know, you, these women, you know, this, this image represents the, the rage and the anger that I was feeling at that time. It, it perfectly captures that. And, you know, these, these women could be, like, these are the aunties, these are the sisters, these, this is us, you know, and these women were leading uh, the, the chants and the marches towards City Hall. Um, Next slide, please. So I wanted to include, you know, this, this second frame from this same uh, moment, just, uh, just another frame from it, because I just love this. This is, you know, whereas the first image showed the rage and the anger, in the next instance, this is showing a little bit of, you know, the joy, because uh, this was when, these women were, were leading a chant of say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And, you know, it, it shows you that how, how we can encompass that anger, that rage, that resistance, but also have that joy as well. And, you know, I just, from, from the, the sister from her hand to her jewelry, to her beautiful black skin, um, you know, she, she just represents so many black women that I know and the, the sister in the background with, with her expression right there, you know, she, she's testifying. She's, she's giving me all the feels, you know, of, of what I was feeling that day and in that moment. And so, um, you know, even, even in our pain, we sing, you know, we shout, we dance, we, we find joy. And um, you know, th these are these are our sisters. This is us. So, you can, next slide. So now this this one is from uh, Soul Summit, and Soul Summit in Brooklyn. And Soul Summit is a dance party in in Brooklyn now in Fort Greene Park. One of my favorite parties. Um, you know, I, I miss parties. Don't we all miss miss parties right now? And Soul Summit was just, it was a vibe. 
Um, you know, it was it was a it was a spiritual event where folks would come together, community, family. Um, and this one was shot in, in one of the last soul summits um, to in August of 2019. And um, I, you know, the 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 expression on this sister's face just really kind of says it all. She was her song came on, she was feeling that moment. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a beautiful black gathering and a, and a vibe. So I just wanted to throw in a little soul summit love because we've, we've been deprived of those gatherings. It seems like forever now because of the times of COVID. So we want to definitely give a moment, you know, to, to have that joy break. Next slide. So when we talk about just the archive and, and also um, just the diaspora, this image is from my book, Black Joy and Resistance. And um, if, uh, if you haven't picked it up, you can pick it up on blackjoyandresistance.com. But this image was from uh, South Africa in Johannesburg. I, I shot it in 2015. 15, I happened to be there on vacation and it was during the time where the students uh, marched out of the classrooms and just um, protested all across South Africa because they were hiking up the, the tuition fees. And so when I found out that uh, students were marching in the streets, much like just this year, just this past year, uh, I just had to join them. I had to join the movement. And so this, this shot was taken uh, downtown um, Brown 14, the, uh, the neighborhood's called Brown 14 in uh, Johannesburg. And these sisters were chanting down the, um, the school education secretary to either come down and negotiate with the students or resign. So, you know, all across the di diaspora, Black women are always leading movements, always spearheading change. And so I wanted to include this image just to, to you know, bring it, or bring it, connect the dots between, you know, the continent and here in the States. Um, and next, next slide. So this one was, was taken in July of 2020. And this is the show up for black women candlelight vigil. This was uh, two days and six years after the death of Eric Garner and his mother um, Gwen Carr was there. And so we held space for her held space for her granddaughter, um, Erica Gardner, and held space for all of the women that we've lost to violence and that we've lost too soon. And this was in Brooklyn in front of the Brooklyn Museum, the show up for black women vigil. Um, just, a, just a beautiful moment um, in this very much black woman led movement that was happening this summer um, and just one of my favorite images as the the candle is illuminating the very important message that we have to show up for black women and so yes that's what that one is um, next slide so this, this is a, a, a some more black joy you know because we, we need that balance and this is um, just Black Man Bliss. Uh, this is from my book, Black Joy and Resistance. And it, it was shot uh, in August of 2016 at Afropunk. And, you know, this one, um, obviously, it's, this man is, is in a state of bliss, listening to his favorite music, throwing his head back. And it's, it's just something that's so just spiritual when black folks are like really getting into their favorite music and their song. We have such a connection to just to that rhythm and there's such just a freedom and a joy in it. 
And, uh, you know, this photo captures that, not only with the, the, the brother in the foreground, but everyone that's, that's also dancing and, and swaying behind him. And um, I, love, I love this moment. Um, it's a perfect black joy, uh, black man, black boy joy um, break. And so, yeah, next slide. So here we are again, back to 2020, uh, you know, our, our protests. This, this was June 13th, 2020, the Black Excellence March. And here, you know, we are marching over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan, obviously holding up signs honoring our, our little sister, Breonna Taylor. Um, you know, this, this image is a powerful one for me. Um, it, it, for me, it shows the, the, the determination that we had, uh, to, to bring Brianna's killers to justice, to just turn the tides, um, on what, what's been going on forever in our communities and, and with the police brutality and, and such. And, um, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't get justice for Brianna on the other side of that bridge this time, but we have to keep pushing. And so, you know, in, in my small way, I'm honoring her uh, with, with this image and this body of work to just try to continue the conversation and, uh, you know, keep pushing forward. Next slide. So um, this one was shot uh, June 21st, 2020. And this is at Lafayette, Lafayette Square. Um, at St. John's Church in Washington, D.C. This is the church where Trump um, had the peaceful protesters tear gassed in order to clear them out so that he could take his photo op uh, at the church. And so this is the church and someone um, spray painted the devil lives across the street. And this brother here was Brother Fred. And Brother Fred was one of the occupants at uh, the encampment that, there, that was built there um, at the church and at Black Lives Matter Plaza there, which is right across the street from the White House. And Brother Fred was a young, gentle guy who was walking around with sage and smudging people um, to try to, you know, just to, to, to realign their energy and push out any bad energy. And so, you know, I, I was able to have this moment with this brother and I, and I just thought that, you know, in, in some ways this was his way of being hopeful in terms of trying to, on a sort of a more spiritual level, trying to shift and change the balance and the energy that was going on down there. Um, we were right by the White House, so there would be sometimes Trump supporters walking by and, you know, folks would get into to arguments and altercations and here comes Fred with, with, the, with the sage smudging him, you know, and um, he just seemed like he was from another time. So I appreciated him a lot and I was able to snap this photograph of him. Next slide. This one here is one of my favorite photos ever um, that I've taken. And this is also from the cover uh, from my book, uh, Black Joy and Resistance. This is the cover photo. This was taken at Afropunk in 2015. And for me, it, it just speaks Black Joy and Resistance. It's, it's free Black youth, just being free to be who they are, um, you know, they, they're living to challenge the status quo. Uh, they're living lives on their own terms and, you know, listening to their favorite, favorite music with, with their friends, having a great time. And, you know, in a lot of ways, just being who they are 
just being free and black is, is a resistance in a lot of ways. And so I wanted to include this image because it's, it's um, one of my favorites, Afropunk 2015 in Brooklyn. Uh, next slide. So this one is uh, more rage from the summer 2020. This one was the day after Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times and we were pissed, needless to say. Um, this was in Times Square. This was photographed in Times Square and uh, right before we went marching, this brother here, you know, he, he was in tears. He spoke to the crowd and he said, he's tired of being peaceful. You know, we was, he really got real tired of peaceful protests when they don't respect us. They don't respect that. They just shot this man in the seven times in the back. So this image uh, just captures all the feels, everything that we were feeling and even just right now thinking about it, it just kind of get, gets me, gets to me a bit. Um, but yes, that was August 24th, 2020 in Times Square and it was the March for Jacob Blake. Next slide. So, you know, again, because we, we like to keep, I like to keep the balance. Um, this is some black queer joy from Soul Summit. Again, this was July 7th, 2019. And I just, you know, black is so beautiful. When we talk about uh, your, the opening video and, and we talk about skin you know, loving our skin. And I mean, how can you not love this, this beautiful black skin and this smile and there's something that's so pure and a connection um, between the, these two men. And um, it, it just really, really shows the spirit of that event. And I really hope that we're able to get back to those type of events because they're, they're important um, for, for our healing, for our self-care. I, I feel like the, these events are important. So hopefully we can, we can have those again sometime sooner than later. Uh, next slide. Again, this is the same, same event. Um, if you imagine your, your favorite house music track playing and everyone is grooving and swaying and you know this is this is movement this is important this is um you know this for me this is self-care when, when I would go to these events it would just I would feel refreshed and recharged and so I, I hope that these images, when we talk about an archive and a record and the living archive and things like that, I hope that these images serve as that and give people a little bit of joy when, when, when they're looking at them. Um, next slide. And here, this one is, um, was, was taken on July 26th, 2020. And this is, this is a, a group of black women leading um, us marchers over uh, the FDR drive in New York. We took over the FDR drive. This was the March for black women. And um, so, you know, what I wanna say here is also just to, to, when we show up for black women, we have to also show up for black trans women too. And so, you know, for I, I want to take this moment to say that, you know, black black trans women is important for for us to acknowledge them as well. And um, this sister in the front, Queen Jean, who was leading um, the Stonewall protest this summer, uh, she was amazing, and um, it was it was such an honor and an inspiration to to follow her. Through, through her protest this summer, as well as the sister that's in the middle from um, 
NYC, uh, Freedom March NYC. And these girls were young, under 25, leading um, thousands of folks through, through, through New York all summer. Um, you know, just just marching and protesting for our rights and raising our voices. And so they were they were really inspirational. And my last slide. Last slide. This is Chelsea Miller from from Freedom March NYC. And uh, this was this was um, the Black Excellence March and we had marched into Union Square Park. Um, and I just want to say, you know, we got to listen to black women, you know, and these young, young women uh, are leading the charge. And so this is one of my favorite images and I wanted to end with it because you, you, you see the, the folks in the background with the raised fist and, and our sister here um, with her megaphone. And like I said, she's about 23 years old. And you know our our youth, they they are obviously our, our future, and they're gonna they're gonna lead us through um, and out of these difficult times. And so, you know, that's that's where I wanna end my presentation, and um, just say that you know we we the Trump presidency you know might be over, but the end of white terror is not over. So we have to center black joy and resistance as a means of self-preservation and self-care. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it, it's all that. Thank you. Thank you so much for yes. the, the beautiful images and the feelings that were coming. Um, I know we have some thoughts and some questions as well, and I'm, I'm going to try to get to all of them. I do want to circle back to two things um, in your presentation, Adrian. One is uh, showing up for Black women, this Black women vigils that have also had to become um, stated, expressly stated, that, that, is, uh, that that's what we're doing in addition to standing up for Black lives, a movement for Black lives, and that trans women are women and that are part of that conversation. And then the other piece is around Black gay joy, Black lesbian joy, Black queer joy, um, and how that uh, shows up in your work. And if, if we could you know, talk a little bit about you know, kind of the lusciousness and the, the robustness of, of both of those, um, both of those aspects of your lens. Um, in your talk, so sure. let, let, yeah, yeah, let, let's say a little bit. I mean, I, I identify as, as a black queer woman. Um, I don't know if it shows up, you know, in the way in which I expressly uh, engage in my curatorial practice, but I know that I, as a, a person who makes space and, and creates opportunity for ceremony and ritual to happen as my curatorial practice, that uh, queer folks, lesbian folks, uh, gender non-conforming folks are all invited and that our stories are, uh, I wanna say exalted, mm -hmm. you know, in those ceremonies. And I find myself feeling um, seen and just kind of like feeling protected by your imagery of, of mm -hmm. black queer people. Can, mm, can that's that? Well, that's wonderful and I'm glad I'm, I'm I am honored and happy that that you do feel that and you do feel so. I mean, I think that uh, black queer folk are um, always, they're at the forefront of many movements and in, all, in, in those spaces where I find joy, um, they're always there. Um, and so when I capture, when I'm in a space where I'm capturing joy, um, I'm, I'm always drawn to, to that energy and that, that you that I find in those spaces, in those, those Black queer spaces. And so I want to give, um, I want to, to highlight and feature in my work, um, the, the beauty of blackness in all of its forms and certainly the that 
that queerness is ever present. Um, and so, you know, it's my sort of, uh, I guess, it, it, it's my calling to shine the light on it, on it, and to, you know, I don't know, yeah. celebrate, help to celebrate all that we are. All that we are. I have, I have another piece that I want to bring up, but I, I want to get into um, Zoe, your presentation, and then we'll take some of the questions and thoughts that are in the chat as well. Okay. Zoe, are you ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you, Adrian. It's so beautiful, Adrian. Sure. Yeah. Um, let me get my notes up so I can kind of see what, so I can make the points that I want to. Um, yeah, I think you you really described my practice perfectly. I, I do a lot of different things, um, but I'm showing mainly uh, works on paper or drawings today. Um, so I tell stories and some of them are true. There are lots of embellishments in them, um, but at the core they're uh, fictions that are based in personal experiences. And the work that's on the screen right now is um, an anchor piece to a series called The Compromise that, com that combines figurative elements with collage landscapes. And I actually made this series uh, in reflection of my maternal grandmother who in the 1940s began purchasing property with her husband in the Florida Panhandle. And the title of each work in this series um, are lines from Frederick Douglass's speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And it's a speech that he gave on July 5th in 1852. But every time, and I read this speech every year, um, every time I read it, it reminds me of my grandmother and her joy and resistance, her sheer audacity to live and raise children um, in a world in her world and in her community on her own terms that she shaped for herself and her family. Um, and this particular piece is called The Country, A Wilderness Unsubdued. And it's about 70 inches wide, give or take, um, and about 110 inches tall. Um, and the width of them changes depending on the amount of wall space that I have. Um, and then next. And um, this piece is uh, called My First Name is Hers. And what I'm doing is I'm archiving stories and histories and my own musings and ideas about family and um, friends and situations. Um, and I made this piece called My First Name is Hers um, as a kind of crest for my grandmother. Um, and the two Harrington and Richardson topper model shotguns that she owned that I inherited. And, um, and the collaged landscapes and the plants reference, um, remind me of her. They remind me of the property that she owned and the woods around that property that surrounded her home. Next. And, um, and here is her home. That's this, you know, Florida Panhandle home. And it just reminds me, making these larger drawings with collage elements reminds me of her planted tea, you know, tea bushes, tea rose, roses, and the peach tree and the walnut trees and the towering live oaks that were surrounding her house. Um, and that ubiquitous blue, light blue house. Um, next. And it led me um, to do this, this piece. Um, and you know, with the help and the expertise of builders and artists in at Art Pace San Antonio, um, we fashioned a half scale replica of her home that I uh, designed from memory and talking with um, like three generations of cousins that had passed through that house. Um, and it's complete with uh, small blue painted suburban style houses in the belly of this house. So it's, it's underneath, it's um, tilted on its, on its roof. And, um, and when my grandmother passed away, all of her children sold the property that she had deeded to them to a developer who ended up building a gated suburban community on this land. Um, 
And it's interesting because this part of the city had once been considered the, the country, you know, and, um, and it had become prime real, real estate in the 90s. And, um, and she had had more property that she ended up selling for a variety of reasons. And, and though my family wasn't displaced in the way that we always think about, or I always think about displacement and, um, and gentrification, um, the purchase of this land and the redevelopment of it, of this, of, you know, my family's homestead really made me think and makes me think about gentrification and the impact on communities. Next. And this house shows up in a lot of other work, this ubiquitous blue house um, as a symbol of, of a place that's been important to me as a marker of home, as a kind of community anchor, um, and, as a, and as an image that holds memory, just like this body that I'm drawing. And these bodies are like her bodies. They're my aunt's bodies. They're my cousin's bodies. They are large women's bodies. And I, I love the way that you described um, our bodies, Ashara, at the very beginning. Um, yeah, because it's, it's in these, this flesh and these folds that this memory resides. Next. I'm often asked where I pull my images from, and I'm so glad that you asked me that uh, during our, our tech run. And so I thought I'd show this image. Um, I buy a bunch of stickers. I'm probably a scrapbooker's like dream. Um, and so I scan them and I enlarge them and print them out on watercolor paper and vinyl and tracing paper. And then I combine them with painted sections and drawn figures of women to make these large wall scale installations next. And this is an example of what it looks like when I'm installing them. And um, if, if I have the luxury of having a lift, and this was at the Baltimore Museum of Art um, when I was installing my very first one of these um, drawing and collages, um, and it was called Companion Constant. And it was actually about Kalulu, the 13-year-old Tanzanian child who was both an enslaved African and the adopted child of this white explorer um, and journalist named Henry Morton Stanley. Next. Um, this is a piece called Branch of Knowledge and uh, it just reminds me of my family. Like I said, I have a matriarchal family. There are lots of women in my family. Um, and, um, and every last one of my aunts and my cousins have different features. And I find those features in these masks that I keep referencing and using in these drawings and collages. Next. And this piece is called Hopefully Looking for Life, which is also a line from um, the Frederick Douglass speech. And it is probably about like 110, 115 um, inches tall and about 70 uh, inches wide. And it is, the drawing is at the very top and it's a drawing of a woman's breasts and all of these masks, it's all culture, all community that is that is um, leaping towards her to suckle, to be nourished, to be fed. And, um, and it's us feeding us. Next. Um, this is an installation shot of a piece called uh, COO, which stands for country of origin. And so I've been using these masks off and on um, for over the last like handful of years, probably about 10 years now. And there are six distinct styles of masks and they're from the Feng, Bembe, Luva, Lega, and they represent three countries, uh, three different countries. There's the Republic of Cameroon, there's the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, and the Gavanese Republic. And these masks are actually hand cast replicas of the originals. Um, that are cast in plastic and, um, and painted in extremely bright colors. And the significance of the material plastic is really complicated and complex for me. Um, at the same time that it comments upon labor and something that is cheaply made and commodity, it also references commodity and the malleability and the resilience of, of culture and of people. Um, of us. And my one of my last images of the work that I'd like to show is this sculptural work. Um, the next slide. 
Um, and this is called SIB. And there are actually six of these figures in SIB. And, um, but it was in a show called Rendition, a solo show called Rendition. And it's my attempt to make a replica. Um, I'm a twin, I have a twin brother. And there are, we are the, I think fourth set of twins on my mother's, yeah, the fourth set of twins on my mother's side. My grandfather was a twin boy, girl twin. Um, and we are the second set of twins on my dad's side. So twinning happens a lot in my family. Um, but it's really my attempt to make a replica of duplicating a body that because of the conditions of my hand, of the material chance and process, and even opportunity that the genetic coding um, generates variations that result in individuality. Um, and there, they are renditions of a statue, an African statue that mirrors my height and general size. And it's attributed to the Bangwa in Cameroon. And so um, there are six versions of Sib and I've named her Sib for sibling. Um, and each one is black and blue. And they are, even though they're products of the same mold, um, they are just not identical. And to speak to the theme of today of joy, resistance, and rage, um, what I did with my frustration and then my anger is that I actually had to stop and hold my own space. And, um, and I became really tired of moving through spaces with anger. And so what happened in the summer is that love made me move and collaborate and find ways to collaborate. And that just is my last slide. And um, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things is um, I joined two coalitions. One is the circuit and the other one is the blacksmiths. Um, and the circuit was founded in the summer of 2020 by two artists, um, Jamia Richmond Edwards and Helena Met um, Metaferia. And they formed this in the middle and the, and, of and the response to the murder of George Floyd, a global health pandemic, the economic crisis and a political revolution. Um, that centered on justice for black lives. And, um, and the coalition serves as a self-sustaining system of internal support for black liberation. Um, and, um, and there are about 40 members right now and we'll be live in about two to three months. So please keep on the lookout for the circuit. And the second one is the Blacksmiths, which is a coalition of artists, curators, culture producers and activators and organizers that are committed to using the arts to support direct action and civic engagement in the service of black liberation. And, um, and I invite everyone to go to wearetheblacksmiths.com to read through our manifesto and to read through some of the collected information or all the collected information in the racial equity toolkit and be inspired to, to sign the pledge the individual and the organizational pledge and commit to uh, black liberation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that story that you just told us and uh, the navigation across our bodies and our skins and the stories and um, your grandmother's house. You know, um, I still have things in my grandmother's house in Denver and yeah. I think about um, what that meant, you know, to go to your grandma's house and, and be cared for and knew that you belonged there, you know, and for those of you who had that view. Yes, complete belonging. Complete belonging. I have to show this to you because I was home. I was in Florida for a couple of weeks and going through some old things. And I found these crochet footies that my grandmother made. My grandmother used to make those. And I, and and I, look, on the front. look at Adrian yeah, laughing at us. I, know. I got these so I brought them home because I'm gonna put them on I'm like, I don't know wear them <laughs> <laughs> I totally used to have those um, I want to read one of the the uh, thoughts or maybe it's a question that's in the chat from uh, Aja Aja Lene because it relates to my grandmother and and, and obviously your grandmother maybe Adrian yours as well uh, they say, so grateful for the moment to reflect on the sentimental small moments of love and care around the fat Black women who've nurtured us and 
there our bodies wonder if y'all could talk more about that at the end if there's space so um i want to just make the space for you know for that acknowledgement of belonging and um, the love that comes from continues and has come from fat black women you say yeah. a little bit more about that adrian do you have some thoughts about that um you know black women large black women just represent home you know, you just, you can just fall into those folds and it's just, it's like, it, it, it's a hug, you know, it's going to always hold you close. It's, there's comfort in that, you know, there's security and warmth in that. So, I mean, it's where we all come from, you, you know, just goodness. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, it is, oh my gosh, it's such goodness. You know, all the women in my family are larger women, all my aunts are, and that's all I know. You know, it, it's from, you know, all parts of life, health reasons, having babies, lots of babies, right? And, um, and just sitting in, sitting in space, holding space, occupying space. I mean, you know, there was a time when we understood that to be large was to be wealthy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and I think about that a lot. I mean, you know, someone that's like my size and, and you know, I, my aunts would always laugh and say, don't get too big, don't stay too small. You know, and I always thought that that was so funny. And, um, but, um, you know, I, I'm, when I look at women and I think about what, who a woman is, I do, I do tend to think about size because that's what's familiar to me. You know, my aunt's and my grandmother's body is very familiar to me. My mother's body and the size of her is very familiar to me. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of body that I wanna see, you know, out in the world. I wanna see always in my work, you know? Um, it's familiar. That what's that? I said there's power in that body. No, there no. is. Yes. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You know what? When my grandmother moved, you moved. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> we, all, yeah. so I, yeah. we all moved. So I was like, yes, yes, yes. Can we let? Can we talk a little bit about about grief and about grief in the body? Um, yeah. Over the weekend, uh, here in Oakland, uh, an organization called the Anti Police Terror Project hosted their seventh. Uh, annual Reclaim MLK Day. And, you know, the kind of a, a multiple offerings of different kinds of programming that um, push back on uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King uh, as a pacifist in this way that was not about revolution. And reclaiming, mm -hmm. you know, his radical, honestly, uh, cosmological uh, ideals and, and ways of being. Um, and ways in which we can like take those lessons and, and put them into our daily practices. But there was also a conversation where black women uh, created an opportunity for wailing to honor grief and to honor rage. And that there was an offering around that. And I, and I know that while black women hold so much uh, and continue to like rescue and save you know, humanity, we often don't have the opportunity to um, speak about our rage and our grief and how it sets up in our body. Yeah. And so, I mean, let, let's, let's, let's spend a, a couple of minutes now, you know, just starting to pull the thread around, um, you know, what it means to like live with this weight of grief, because what's happening is that we're, many of us are acknowledging that we're in this collective cycle of grief and it's it's truly heavy mm -hmm. um, and it's heavy on the bones you know it's heavy on the spirit uh and and we see you know what happens as as society acts out uh our rage and you know is it impacting your artwork your own um your own being are you feeling are you feeling grief and is grief showing up in your in your practices Mm. yeah that's that's a really that's a really great question yeah like who's i can't remember the sister's name that described this as um 
you know, it's weathering. It's kind of weathering because this kind of grief, this kind of rage is cumulative. And um, you're, yeah, it, and it does, it starts to show up um, in communities in the world and, and it affects many of the things that we do. I know it affects a lot of my decisions. It's actually um, um, made me more willing to uh, say no, right? And, um, and, and, and stop and pause. And so, you know, the way that that grief, that, um, that frustration or, and rage um, sometimes will show up in immobility. But the thing that I get most worried about is when it shows up as disease in our bodies. And so when there's not a real outlet for it. And, um, and it's not that it always shows up as like disease, but it, it and, um, and like for me, it can enable behaviors that can contribute to it where I don't sort of pay attention to those things. And, and so I think, um, yeah, sitting, sitting um, in those spaces um, is really difficult for me um, because then I don't sleep. You know, I don't, I can't pay attention to things. Um, and I think where um, many times um, rage is a good motivator and a good way to react and respond to things, um, it has the tendency to, immo to, to immobilize yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think about these other things. And so, um, yeah, so I get to, I have to spend time thinking and I'll tell you what else it did. Um, the way that it, I started to see, and I always see, but, you know, I really started to see how it was impacting my body is I went to a residency for an entire month on the other side of this country yeah. just to get out of the space that I was in during a pandemic, you know, because I actually needed the separation in order to refocus and re adjust, reset my body and my head and my thinking that's interesting uh zoe that you talk about you know this effect on your body because um the the grief and the rage and the anger i found was i was allowing it to to build up inside of me and i think i was like repressing it and, and with no sort of outlet and, and not really realizing how it was affecting me, but it was affecting my health, you know, affecting my sleep patterns, um, mm -hmm. affect, affecting actually my, my, um, my health, like my, my uh, reproductive health actually. And so, you know, um, which led to hot flashes and sleepless nights and things like that. And so, you know, I had to figure out a way to, to let go of it, a way to let it out, a way to express it. And sometimes when, when you're so bogged down with, with, the, with the rage and the anger and the, and the grief, it, it makes you, it makes me not want to be creative, but I have to figure out a way to turn that around because actually tapping into the, a creative outlet is what helps me, what, what actually helps to bring me out of those spaces. And so getting back to my art and figuring out how to, to express that, that what I'm feeling, that anger, that rage, express it, that ends up then helping me to move me beyond that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we talk about this, these conversations, this platform as artist, as first responder. We talk about the fact that we creatives, we artists haven't had a day off. COVID mm -hmm. did not stop the creativity. It may have, we may have taken a rest and taken, you know, I took a lot of time to sleep, a lot of time to sleep, but it did not stop the creative process because that's who shows up when there's a problem. Whether or not you identify that way, your creative divine self shows up to try to fix it and to document it and to, you know, look at it again and turn it over. 
And I'm remembering um, one of my mentors, uh, visual artist Eve Sandler in New York City, was one of the co-founders of a collective called Women in Mourning and Outrage. Mm -hmm. um, that was launched when the New York City police killed Amadou Diallo. And mm -hmm. women, you know, from the East African community, from the African American community, the Dominican, I mean, Black women showed up in Black veiled and started mm -hmm. uh, the process of, of sitting and being in silence at the places where Black people had been killed by state sanctioned violence by police. And so this uh, conversation that we were, I said, you know, pulling the thread on the timeline, go back and fetch it, women wailing, black women wailing, black women honoring uh, the, the, how do you let it go? As she said, Adrian, like, how do I get this off? You know, so the, the power of that. Um, mm -hmm. I wanna try to get, if you wanna say something, please say something now. I wanna try to get a couple of more of the thoughts and questions from the chat. Uh, into into here as well, but Zoe, were you? Was there something you were gonna? You know, there was so much. You know what? No, because we moved on. This I was just like, Whoa. <laughs> okay. it was great. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Georgina uh, Rascala asked, as a Mexican artist living in the U.S., I struggle with the art world, the language used, and all of the references. I'm always being compared or measured to white artists as if whiteness is the normalcy and the university, universal <laughs> and the university. Ha, how do we create a new language? <laughs> Creating a Whoa. new work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Yeah. How do we create a new language, you know, that does not center whiteness? Yeah. In our work as artists. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's a, that's a pretty loaded question. I, I don't, I, I, that's one that I could talk about for like an hour. And, um, and often where I start is in spaces of learning and the information brought into those spaces can't center whiteness, which, which changes the way that we all think. So that when we're thinking, we don't center whiteness. And so the images that we see around us in the context that we build can't center whiteness in order for that language to change. I think changes, uh, language changes when our actions change and our actions change when our language change. So then we have to do both of those things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, I feel your frustration, um, Georgina, because um, uh, it's one of the most insulting things that can happen to black artists and to artists of color, like to see only to be re to only be referenced by, you know, that which does not acknowledge, right? Acknowledge us. Um, and so we, we end up making our own contexts and our own spaces. And that's how we move um, through and beyond that and even if you want to say in spite of that we we do um that yeah that's a that's a that's one yeah. to tackle it is it, and then mm -hmm. we can quickly it kind of leads into another question that lena uh had put in the chat around uh specifically well, for both of you um wondering if you all incorporate your practice with your students do you share with them your work with them and how might that shift in this time in this idea of like your students creating a new language, how might your work and what has happened uh, or you know transformed in your work in this last 12 months, how might that move you to create new language and new ways of teaching uh, in whatever circles they may be in the academy or, or, or whatever. Thank you for that, for that question, you know. Right, um, that's a great one. Where do you teach, you, where do you teach at which university? Me, um, I'm at um, okay. I'm at American University in DC. That's right. Do you incorporate? Do you show your students your work? My I, you know what, I do, I do, and um, so the way that that has shifted is that I don't, I um, don't spend a lot of time showing the work of um, 
white, straight men. Mm -hmm. um, because there is not a reason, you know, um, students will get uh, images and, and know about those artists from their other classes. Yeah. And so, um, and, and that was, a, that was a, a politic I adopted early on when I started teaching. And it was really a result in how I was learning and how I, what I, and how I was taught. Um, so I do, one of the ways that that shifts in a lot of different kinds of spaces, whether it's like mentorship space or academic spaces is that um, um, in, mainly in the things that I'm reading, you know, I'm, I'm looking at teaching to transgress and teaching community and, you know, transgressing community and, and, and those and, you know, pedagogy of the oppressed. And I like, I'm really thinking through those lenses and which tells me that, um, you know, my experience of making and learning is the same as everybody else's space of making and learn learning. So as learners, we can do a lot of shared things and so my language, my language has shifted because of that, because of thinking differently about uh, my position or my role, if you will, um, you know, in collaboration with somebody else. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to be wrapping up soon, and uh, I want to. Adrian, I want to I want to just kind of maybe complicate the conversation here around creating a new language through your photography and through I mean through your other art forms, but specifically through the photography and what feels urgent right now. As you know, as this show, as we're speaking right now, is the last full day of Donald Trump being the president of the United States. That's what that's what this day also represents. So there's yeah. a transfer of power. Um, and uh, a way in which the conversation has been documented. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, how that, the reality that uh, a black uh, Indian woman named Kamala Harris is going to hold the second highest office, mm -hmm. uh, this position of power in the United States and, and how that might unfold for the archives that you continue to create and, and the centering of black women. Yes, a black and Southeast Asian woman from Howard University is becoming- Thank you. Yes. Yes. The vice president, yes. Um, okay. Born in Oakland, California. <laughs> yes, Oakland, California, Oak Town, the Bay Area, and back down. Um, so, you know, this is an exciting time because of the possibilities, because of Kamala Harris be, being in office. And, you know, as much work as we have to do as as frightening, as horrifying, as infuriating as the uh, Capitol uh, insurrection was, and mm -hmm. you know, to experience um, all of the peaceful protests that, that I experienced in, two, in 2020, and and see the way that the police treated us versus the way the police treated the yeah. the uh, seditionists on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill, um, yeah. you know, yep. there's, yeah. you know, we could be so angry about so many things and we have the right to be, but we have to um, find the hope and we have to start a new conversation and continue the movement forward. And so for me, that is, you know, as a, as a photojournalist, I will be continuing to capture these moments, continuing to contribute imagery that will, you know, celebrate us, celebrate Black folks, and, and um, continue to, to, to change sort of the narrative um, and control the narrative 
and center our voices and, um, you know, in our lives. And, and so in that way, I feel like that's my small contribution. And I'm not even sure if I answered your question. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, in terms of the narrative, you know, we, I have to continue to contribute to it every day. And, you know, and, and for me being a photographer, that is the visual narrative, you know, mm -hmm. and so the beauty of photography is that it is what it is. You photograph a thing and that is the proof that that is what it is at that time. So it's my job to hold a mirror up to society mm -hmm. and it's my job to shine a light on our stories and promote our, our beauty. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to continue to do. Mm -hmm. Right on. Yes. Yeva uh, in the chat talking about y'all creating a narrative in a new language today. So yeah. I, I just so appreciate both of you spending an hour and a half with me today. Oh, yeah. um, we're going to do a couple of announcements. Um, again, blatant, not only is it this monthly forum that happens on the third Tuesdays, we also have a quarterly zine. And uh, the zine is available on my website at ashara.io and you can find it at blatant.zine. There's a free download, you can look at it. And then I'm uh, in the process right now of working on episode two. So this one came out in September. It's for sale on the Moads website in the bookstore. There are a couple of, um, the curator and me could not resist creating you know, a limited edition print. So there are a couple of them, of course, for sale. So I want to invite you all to, to check that out. And you'll, again, you'll be able to see one of um, Adrienne Mahid's images is in the like page two uh, of the conversation. And I hope that Zoe, you'll, you'll submit something for us for this upcoming episode as well or issue as well. And uh, there's also going to be a conversation on another um, aspect of the Artists as First Responder platform, which is Black Space Residency, which is an actual physical residency container for imagination, inquiry, activity, and rest for Black creatives here in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, actually, at um, Minnesota Street Project, uh, some really beautiful opportunity for Black artists, creatives across genre to um, take up space. So you can Look that up at blackspaceresidency.com. Wow. Um, and on February 26th, is the last Friday of February, uh, myself, co-founder Erica Demon, who is a fierce, beautiful photographer, uh, Benta Ayofemi, who is a multimedia artist, and uh, another photographer, our brother comrade, Ron Moultrie Saunders, will be in conversation on MOAD for a lunchtime conversation um, talking about Black Space Residency. So with that, I just wanna, I wanna thank you all for, for tuning in and thank all of the partners for Artists as First Responder. And uh, I'm really excited about this new year. Next month, we're gonna pop off with Black Film. Uh, yeah. Long time comrades right here, Yoruba Richin and brilliant, brilliant multimedia curator and filmmaker, Mayori Holmes. Uh, we'll be in conversation next month, and I'm really excited. Um, for many years, I, I curated the Denver Pan-African Film Festival, and I spent a lot of time with Black filmmakers all over the planet, and uh, Yoruba and Mayori were two artists. We would be in West Africa together, we'd be in New York together, we'd be in Atlanta, and I haven't had the opportunity to speak with either of them in many years, so I'm really excited to, to host their conversation next month on Blatant. So you can RSVP on the MOAD website. And uh, also just big ups to Artists as First Responder partners, which include the Girls and Women of Color Collaborative, the African American Art and Culture Complex in San Francisco, Akhenati Foundation, the Foundation, the Wakanda Dream Lab, the Women's Foundation of California and the Walter and Elise Haas Fund. So we're just trying to figure this out. This is one, one pillar on top of this platform. And um, with that, do you all have any like one word to, to close us out today? I'm so I'm so grateful to have had time with both of you in your a little bit a little peek into your practice, um, and oh for God. supporting us. What do you want to say? It's beautiful. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I want to invite you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'm glad y'all like got in here with us and and for the Museum of the Diaspora for hosting us. And I want to yeah. become a member. I'm a member of Moab. Become a member of the local museums in your area. Support the galleries if they're open. Support them if they're not open. But you can you can give to Moab. You know, just a one-time gift, a monthly gift. You can text it right now. It's on the screen five six five one two, and then you type in Moad M O A D S F, and then you can make a donation or use the QR code. I'm just happy to have you all and happy to have. Uh, an opportunity and a platform to share the blatant love of art, joy, and rage uh, every month here. And I invite you to, to follow all of these artists on Instagram, on their yeah. website. And if you want to watch past episodes, you can go to the YouTube channel for Moad and you can see every brilliant yeah. talk that they have yeah. put forth, you know, like upped it to a whole nother level in the last 12 months. So. Thank you, Elizabeth, for, for running tech with us today. And thank you all for joining us. See you next month. Love you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.